Welcome back. I'm Michael Stamatinos, your host for the Advancing Health Innovation Show. And if you're new to us, we are absolutely crazy passionate about healthcare innovation and adoption of these innovations. And our aim is to bring real life stories of innovators within the space that are executing day in and day out. And we've got just an amazing highlight reel of interviews going on this in this within this next six months. So if, uh, if you haven't joined us, make sure you stay tuned in for the additional episodes coming up. And I'm just absolutely delighted today to bring to you a, a dear colleague and a good friend, Karthik Session, who is the CEO of NeuroAlert. And I, I really wanted to focus on sort of innovation within sub niches within healthcare. And Karthik, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike, it's, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I, this is one of my favorite topics um, both, uh, when I engage in, you know, with team members in my organization, as well as talking to, talking to you and, and we've had a, a number of these conversations in the past. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here to continue the conversation with you and hopefully provide some insight to some of your viewers. Awesome. So, I mean, just before we get kind of dive and, and roll into things, it's, um, not many people really know about the world of interoperative neuromonitoring. And I'm wondering if you can kind of maybe shed some light on that, your history, your background, the company, a little bit more of its origin story and how you uh, are now at the helm leading it into sort of the next, the next frontier. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a saga, but I'm going to try to be as, uh, as concise as I can. Um, I, uh, I graduated uh, from Johns Hopkins with uh, degrees in engin electrical engineering and entrepreneurship. I then went on to complete my master's at, at Johns Hopkins in, master, in, in engineering management. So it was kind of combining, combining the two. Uh, I was in the startup world for a little while. Um, I kind of sort of lived the dream, but also uh, starved a little bit, which was um, kind of both fun and um, let's just say good, ex good experiences to, to have, you know, staying in in, in motels and, and, and trying, to, trying to make my dreams come true. But I think the most, uh, something really interesting happened to me um, in 2012. And my, my father, who uh, was the founder of NeuroAlert, um, he was a physician, board certified in physical medicine, rehabilitation, physiatry uh, for short. Um, he had a private practice in PM&R um, and decided in 2006, 2007 to pivot into a field called intraoperative neurophysiology. And for background, what that is, is the, um, the real time in our case, and in today's day and age, is the real time monitoring of the neurologic system while patients are undergoing uh, surgeries that are high risk to the neurologic system, such as spine surgery, uh, brain surgery, vascular surgery, there are certain types of cardiac surgery, peripheral nerve surgery, where uh, the nervous system, the nerves and the muscles are, are, are at risk. And what we're doing, we have a, a collaborative group of physicians and non-physician neurophysiology techs that are working together to run tests while the patient is under general anesthesia to assess the integrity of the nervous system. And this is for, for, for two reasons. It's to provide navigation to the surgeon. Oftentimes it can be uh, a level of mapping where they are when, um, uh, when they're kind of uh, wrist deep into, into a patient, uh, not to be morbid, but, um, but also to uh, act as a, as a safety valve and a safety protocol for the surgeons who are, who are operating. And uh, obviously, this is not to say that any one surgeon or not is, is skilled or not, but you know what? Um, it, we all have insurance policies on our car. We, you know, we have you know, safety mechanisms in place just in case something happens. And sometimes the worst can happen despite best intentions. And so um, part of the role that we play is to support the surgical team to be a valuable part of uh, patient care. And the way I put it to uh, folks that are just learning about interoperative neurophysiology is that our hope for these patients uh, and, and our, our, our internal mandate is that our patients leave surgery at least as well as they went in and hopefully better as a result of surgical intervention and so on. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, um, uh, 
people won't know the impact that we have. If you're looking at a black, if we're looking at surgery as a black box, we're, we're like somewhere in that black box and making sure the worst doesn't happen from a neurologic standpoint, right? Whether it be um, uh, seizure, or stroke, interruptive seizure or stroke or, um, or um, accidentally getting too close to a, uh, to, a, a, to a nerve, um, to the spinal cord and so on. Um, so sometimes people won't know what, what our contributions were. And um, it's, uh, that's, that's been a struggle, but also an opportunity for us to demonstrate uh, why uh, this field in neurodiagnostics really matters. So my, my father, Dr. TV Station, um, actually started, uh, in, started uh, practicing intraoperative neurophysiology back in the very early 80s when it, was a, it required a whole lot of jerry-rigging. It was my dad going to the biomedical engineering folks at uh, Westchester Medical Center uh, affiliated with New York Medical College and basically saying, well, actually he was asked by a spine surgeon, hey, you know, you've been doing running these, these uh, evoke potential tests on my patients preoperatively, you know, can you figure out a way to do this intraoperatively? And so my dad had to, you know, kind of work through some things and he worked with biomedical engineering folks there and they jerry-rigged uh, an evoke, essentially an EMG, an evoke potential machine. EMG stands for electromyography. Um, and, and, and broadly speaking, it's measuring the, the muscular activity of patients. Um, but uh, so he actually put something together and he was able to start providing a, a, an early sort of high level of service to this deformity, you know, the spine surgeon who was perform performing these very complex uh, deformity cases on, especially on uh, uh, pediatric and, and um, adolescent teens. And so big cases, long cases. Um, and so now this has become increasingly a standard of care for at least in deformity cases and beyond that in cervical cases, thora general thoracolumbar cases, uh, definitely certainly in neurovascular cases, uh, cases where there's uh, resection, uh, tumor resection in the brain, in the spinal cord, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so he uh, decided in 2006, 2007 to pivot over to practicing this particular medicine more dedicatedly. And he built this practice based on his referring relationships from the surgeons that he had worked with for many, many years in the Westchester and New York area. And well, what a brilliant move that was because it was almost an instantaneous bed of, uh, bed of uh, business for him, from, uh, for, his, for his practice. Fast forward a number of years, uh, very entrepreneurial, um, picking up business left and right. Um, sometimes, sometimes even just very accidentally, you know, just running into something. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we're going to have to figure out how to build out the infrastructure to serve these new clients, you know, and 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 not just small clients, big big clients. Uh, I think that one of the pivotal moments in the history of the organization was. Um, uh, securing an exclusive arrangement with uh, Westchester Medical Center to, to be the exclusive provider of neurophysiology. And that was a really big deal. I was actually having lunch earlier today with uh, my, my father's former practice manager who was with him for 19 plus years. And it was, it was interesting. My father passed away five years ago uh, this month. And we were just reflecting on some of the experiences that we had. And I was talking to him about, man, it must have been really exciting back then, you know. Like, you know, and, and by the way, in, in the in the context of innovation and 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 thinking about innovation, not just in terms of you know building the next new product, but the way we do business, the way people feel um, about receiving service, the the way they decipher and perceive value, right? It must have been so exciting back then. He was reflecting on it too. He goes, man, you have no idea. We were just, we were just going, you, it was just me and your dad. And anyway, it was, it was a, it was a great reflective conversation. Um, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think there's a, there's an aspect of what you had mentioned about, you know, your father, you know, really being an inventor, you know, I think there's a difference between invention and innovation and what you were talking about, about the, the experience and the delivery of a service, uh, of a product, whatever it might be, that that sort of contributes to the innovation of things. I mean, how do you, has, has your definition of innovation evolved through, you know, coming into a leadership role? I mean, what is it, what is it like today? And yeah, absolutely. 
So I joined in joined in 2012 uh, as uh, my my essentially my dad's administrative assistant, and uh, I had by the way very accidental, and that was the whole the whole point. I came from my own startup world and my own world to healthcare in a way that was really fresh. I, I, was, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed, probably a little naive, but I, I started to see opportunity everywhere I looked around me. Right, and it was exciting. It was really exciting, and I, you know, a lot of people, right? I, 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 when I was younger, I used to think that family business there was something wrong with family business, and I look back on it today, and and, and I reflect on it. I said, there's nothing wrong with family business. I was, I was afforded an opportunity, perhaps that a lot of other people weren't. And guess what? My job is to take full advantage of it and not waste it. And part of not wasting it is, you know, in answer in answering your question about my 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 the, the evolution of my perception about innovation is that when I was younger, innovation was about you know thinking about the greats like Steve Jobs and 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 Wozniak and Bill Gates and you know Michael De the Michael Dells of the world like the now Elon Musk's and you know all these folks and granted I mean these are these are people that are that have had a profound impact on 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 all of us but oftentimes when we're younger we associate innovation with inventing a thing that will then get commercialized what we don't realize is that some of these folks if you read their autobiographies or their memoirs or whatever it is a lot of it was just they were so ruthlessly passionate about doing something that was different because it was an opportunity for them to learn. I've been reading this book by Mark Benioff, who's a co-CEO and founder of Salesforce. Really, really inspiring guy. Probably, probably my new, you know, from afar mentor in a lot of ways. And uh, he, he, he talked a lot about when he was a kid, he, he loved um, coding so much that he would just randomly email companies that had bugs in their code and just let them know, hey, by the way, I found a bug in your code. And he loved doing that so much that he ended up getting internships and jobs and people started paying him for consulting and stuff like that, right? So, so fast forward to today, right? Now my more evolved and continuing to evolve perception about this. It's about the, the, the pa our, our passion to learn to, uh, so to me, that's what be, being innovative is. If we're focused on the commercial impact of innovation first and foremost, we're probably gonna lose energy and lose steam along the way because thinking about ROI from a dollar standpoint is only gonna get you so far, right? Is that really a long-term long -term self-motivator? Or is it really your passion to continue to solve problems, to learn about what the problem is, to be obsessed with, with defining the problem more and more so that what comes out of conversations and relationships, and in, in, in a sense, the conversation that you and I are having is that you have this aha moment. And it, it, it's just as simple as, I was wondering about this. You know, I wonder what if, the moment you ask the what if question is the genesis of the next best thing. And I'm, I have been working uh, tirelessly with my organization to orient all of us. And, and, it's, and it's, it's not an easy thing and it's not an overnight uh, mindset, but I think it's really, it's really important for us to think about innovation in a way that it serves our, it, it taps into an energy source internally that just makes us want to do more and more and more and learn and serve to the point where you're just pumping out, you're creating. And suddenly, right, when you surround yourself with the right people, yeah, you might end up with a business. You might end up with something that's larger than life. And anyway, so that's sort of my long-winded answer. To yeah, it sounds, like, it sounds like what you're saying is that there's an aspect of building culture around the notion of innovation, around the desire to serve and solve problems. And, and really that's, you know, at its core, you know, you're, when you're innovating, it's you're, you're fixing little things along the way. And those little things that you're fixing are, are problems that you're no longer problems as you innovate. So we've we've uh, yeah. we've come through a, a season, uh, still in many respects, uh, in a season where many problems have presented itself. 
how how have you guys innovated uh, in this season? I will tell you that my personal forms of innovation have been uh, self reflection. Um, it, you know, and and we are you know because of. Uh, the fact that for a period of time during the early part of COVID-19 and the lockdown, we experienced a, a you know a significant downturn in in business uh, in, in referrals from our, our surgeons and hospitals uh, because of elective surgery uh, and so on. Uh, but it it was um, I, I I reflect back on the year and uh, despite the fact that we have you know millions who have you know suffered, you know, fatality due to COVID, which is, it's hard to think about sometimes. I think if I, if I kind of looked at some of this, the experience a little, little bit in a vacuum, I, I think for people like me, it, it was, it was defining. It allowed me to really force myself to reflect on what, what I want the future to look like and ask the question, what does great look like? So, you know, we oftentimes, uh, when we say, when we're referring to people or the act, act of being creative, we say, think outside the box, right? That's fine. But um, I think increasingly those who, uh, who are obsessed with learning and innovation, it's, by the way, it's not just thinking outside the box. It's, it's actually thinking inside the box, but maybe a new box, a different box, a different set of constraints, right? It's fine if you're suggesting we can't think in this box with these constraints. You know, we have to start thinking about a future, what great looks like with a different set of constraints, reasonable ones that, that we're going to evolve to. Um, and, and, I and I challenge I challenge people in my organization, especially those that are involved in our innovation effort, to, to think that way because it's easy to get bogged down in, in what's happening today. And COVID-19 is a perfect, uh, you know, what we've been going through as, as a as a as a uh, as a global entity, let's say, um, I, I, I think that some of the most transformative inventions, developments, innovations, whether it be uh, humanitarian or a conceptual mindset technology, a lot of them have come from people that are asking those questions. They're asking those questions and uh, they they saw they saw opportunity to help others in a way that they that they that they never saw before and and i think people have been so receptive to this idea of being helped in a way that they've never been helped before that they they now see and they define value so differently i mean simple things like a year and a half ago the number of people that would have said work from home, work, you know, working virtually, working remotely, hybrid work, absolutely not. And suddenly look at us today. And my, by the way, I count myself included in that uh, unfortunate, perhaps majority of, of people, because I was always like a be in person, be there, be present, you know, vi you know, visible type of person, but that's changed. Can't think about the world that way. And so Innovation, start, innovation starts there when you're honest about what your reality is, what the future of reality is going to be. And that's how you can make progress. That's how you can start really thinking, okay, so this is our new reality, or this is going to be our new reality. What does what is best? What is great? What does amazing look like in this reality? And let's start you know, creating the building blocks and the experiments that it's going to take for us to learn about what it's going to take to be successful on that road. Any experiments that are worth noting, whether you know, the, regardless of what the outcome was, any any little wins that you can share, or even setbacks, you know, as you guys have experimented and attempted to innovate in this new environment. I will tell you. Let me let me let me start with the uh, my my gratitude. Let's my gratitude for learning about areas of my organization that needed help. I think that COVID-19 um, really exposed areas of my organization that needed to be addressed, quite frankly. And for perhaps for years, um, it was not at the top of my priority list or the top of the priority list of my management team, not because we didn't care, but because we weren't forced into this sort of introspection mode 
the way we were during COVID-19. And, and it exposed some things that, you know, frankly, they were, some of them were disruptive, some of them were very uncomfortable, some of which were fires, you know, you, you sometimes you ask yourself, you know, what are we doing? Why are we, st-? but that's learning. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's my, my part of the lesson that I've learned is, you know, how can we focus, how can we focus that learning on, all right, we can't keep looking back on why things weren't working, given the reality that we're in right now, what's it going to take from getting from here to a defined place where we want to be. And, um, it's hard. I, you know what, I think anybody that thinks that, it, you know, making progress and innovation is easy. It's not. It requires grit. It requires courage. It requires a lot of honesty, um, and it requires some sacrifice, quite frankly. And um, we're still going through some of that right now. I mean, the world. We're not going to see the full impact of COVID nineteen for uh, probably for a few years, I think. And and really understand the the business impact, the social impact uh, on on all of us, and 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 how it has impacted our ability to create to co and, and even co-create with our colleagues you know people that we meet at, at at trade shows and conferences and you know the the ideas on a napkin that you have when you're when you're having a few glasses of wine at dinner you know those are things that you know we we've kind of struggled with so um, but i'm i'm grateful as i said i'm starting but i'm grateful for the opportunity to have have gone gone through some of that to really to, to feel like I even know now more than ever what it's like to be, to, to, to define resiliency for me, uh, for my organization. And, you know, kind of like if we can get through stuff like this, you know, the challenges that we faced in the last year and a half to whatever it is, we're going to, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. It's, it's about the desire to learn. It's not about placing blame. And I think that's where the greatest ideas come from. Um, the, and, and one of my favorite sayings comes from one of my, one of my mentors, uh, Dan Sullivan, uh, when you, when you own the breakdown, you get to own the breakthrough and you know what I'm putting my, you know, even as an entrepreneur, I'm putting my head down, nose to the grindstone a little bit with respect to some of these breakdowns that we've seen, not only in our organization, but in our industry, right. And in the way we deliver these services to say, all right, you know, I'm going to own this, right? Even if it's, even if people don't feel like I need to own it, I'm going to own it. You know why? Because I know that if I keep, if I, if I keep working on it, if I surround myself with the right people, having conversations with you, uh, with folks like you, Michael, about, about this and, and colleagues and mentors and, and people that can influence me even outside of healthcare, I think that we can, we can solve some of the, the, the grand challenges that we have around the world. And there are so, so many, thousands and thousands of examples of them. And, and I, I think that's really in part the point of your, the, the group that you put together on LinkedIn. I think a, a, a big part of the reason why this webcast uh, exists and, and why this is uh, so fun for you. Yeah, it's about surrounding yourself with those that you know wanna make things better. I mean, you touched on so many different things. I love when you talked about you know owning the breakdown, you get to own the breakthrough. In terms of the clinical delivery, I mean, you're, you're talking about a stoppage in procedures occurring. Yeah, were, were there any were there any breakthroughs in terms of how the service of interoperative neurophysiology has been delivered that you that you can share with the with Yeah, the I think you know with, without without di- without divulging too much of our you know IP and trade secret, uh, but I I, I think. One of the coolest things that came out of thinking about the constraints, the constraints with which we now have to operate, uh, namely the, you know, the fear of infection risk at, at hospitals, as an example, um, the ability to, in our case, the ability to get people into the operating room, to train, to, to train them, to, to even provide services in such a way that is, is a learning, both a learning experience, but also an exercise in making sure that patients are getting the absolute best attention and best care. What we've started to come up with are these sort of niches where we think we may be able to make a real difference. And I'll give you one example. One is, um, hey, 
if we're struggling to get people into the operating room uh, to provide the service, just simply because of access or, hey, a hospital has a particular mandate surrounding their uh, risk behind infection control and so on, what if we could come up with a way to deliver the service remotely, right? We live in 20, freaking 2021. I mean, I, you know, I just updated my iPhone to iOS, uh, to iOS 14.5 14 and I'm finally getting my 5G uh, little icon in the top corner, my God, 5G. And uh, how that's going to, just as 4G changed the world, how is 5G gonna change the world? It's gonna provide more access bandwidth, the ability to do things that we weren't able to do before. And we wanna tap into that type of energy, that the, 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 the abundance of what's out there with respect to access to, to connectivity and technology to find ways to say, hey, do we really need somebody in the operating room? You know, what if there is a way for us to provide the same quality of the exact same quality of service, if not better, because we're on time, we're on time, we're not dealing with things like traffic or getting through biomedical engineering or, you know, having to having to do things that create either infection risk or human error variables, you know, getting to the operating room. And so that's a major initiative that, that, that I've launched in the organization. I'm really proud of it because um, I think that that's, that, that to me, that's gonna be one of the future, future areas of exploration and learning uh, for NeuroAlert. Um, the other is training and education. I mean, similarly, if we can't get, if we're struggling to get people into the operating room, all right? So here's our constraint. We're struggling to get people in the operating room because hospitals, you know, let's just say understandably so, are worried, they're concerned about too many people being in a confined space, right? And, and, and I think that we don't want to be, you know, we as a, as, a, as a society in healthcare, we don't want to be short-sighted about that. But, you know, there's only so much I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight the bear, right? What, 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 can, what, can we, what can we do to appease the bear, right, in some ways and appear, appease the system by, by saying, all right, here's the reality. What's the best case scenario? Well, one of the things that we can work on is uh, simulation. What can we do to simulate more of the training and education experience, whether it's using virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality types of resources and technologies to provide that, that sort of learning feedback for people that we want to uh, become clinicians in our field and, and, and continue to drive um, the level of expertise and the access to that type of care in this field. So those are two um, exciting areas that, uh, that, that, we're, that we're pursuing right now. And, and I hope that you know, in, you know, over the next 12 months as I, have a, have I, as I continue to have these conversations with you that I'm gonna have some really exciting news to share. Yeah, I love how you talk about with innovation, there's the what if, instead of going from why, which oftentimes puts people on the defense, you shift that to, well, what if, right? This has occurred, this is our new reality. Well, what if, what if we could make this better? What if we could change this? I love, I really, really love that mindset, that shift. I mean, it's a two millimeter shift, which oftentimes can mean great gains down the line. So as it pertains to virtual learning, virtual monitoring, uh, are there any reservations around training clinicians, training technicians that haven't necessarily been in a live case? I mean, we right now, look, we have um, several nursing programs around the country that are graduating nurses that have never seen a patient. Do you inherently see, have any reservations around that? That's a, that's a, that's a really, um, pivotal question right now, right? Because this year, last year and this year, uh, because so much was shut down and access to these environments were extremely limited in, in terms of education and training, it does beg the question that you're asking, like, you know, are we, are we worried about the, the, um, the way healthcare services are going to be delivered, the way we care for people, because perhaps there hasn't been sort of that direct uh, connection uh, in that clinical setting, if you will, um, in, in, in whatever, whatever that might be, depending on what this could be nursing, it could be uh, physician assistants, it could be, you know, anything, right? 
right. our surgical neurophysiology texts that 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 go in. Um, I think that uh, it's reasonable to be worried, um, but I'm I, I will say that I'm not worried in the long run. And here's the reason why: we're facing sort of a transient period in our history, where we've had a huge in the world a huge traumatic event has occurred. And so as a result, you end up asking more questions than there are answers. And so this is one of those questions like, well, you know, but if we do this, what's going to happen? I mean, you know, is it going to affect quality in this? You know what, Michael, it, sometimes you won't know the answer right away until you start doing these controlled experiments. And this is what I'm trying to encourage um, with, with my team, right? It's easy to say, well, you know, we're going to get stopped where somebody's going to say, we're not allowed to do this, or we're not allowed to do that. Or the attorney's going to say this and that, and whatever it is. Okay. All right. Understood. We live in a highly regulated and we operate in a highly regulated and, and, uh, a field that has a lot of oversight over it, but what are the, what are the little changes that we can make to start nudging people, right? To start nudging people in the right direction, uh, so that we're, simultaneously articulating our vision while also getting people to buy into the fact that, hey, you know, here, let, let's try this. It's, it's just against the line, but it, it's not going to violate any protocols. Let's keep, let's keep moving in that direction. One of the other, uh, one of the other things that I want to tap into um, without, without, you know, crossing lines with, with, you know, what would be considered ethics is there are so many areas around the world that don't have access still, still in 2021, that don't have the access to the level of care that we do in the United States and other very well-developed healthcare systems around the world, right? And I, I think there's a lot of great investment going there, but even in highly developed areas, there is a lack of access to training and education and, and, and just overall clinical service. Don't we think that in some of those situations, they're going to be willing to, again, in controlled settings, experiment with some of these types of things to, to exponentially increase their, the access to these types of services, right? Sometimes I think because we're, we're in the largest healthcare system on the planet, I mean, our healthcare system is probably several nations GDP, not probably is, several nations GDP combined, right? But we can't, we can't necessarily use the filter of the way we operate in the United States as an example, or the way can Canada operates, the way the UK or France or Germany operate. What about other areas of the world where you have that level of innovation and, and thinking about the problem and learning about what could be available to them if we simply started taking these, these some what seem like incremental steps, but lead to a giant leap, which is not just incremental anymore. Yeah, you know, when you talk, talk about a compound effect, doing little things over long stretches of time equates to big change. And, you know, you mentioned it with innovation. Innovation is around providing value for many. And you, you hit it on several notes, you know, that, that key trigger word for me is access, you know, access to care, access to things that people need to have as, as human beings that we believe people need to be treated with dignity. And that means providing them care, you know, at the time that they need it. So, you know, we're kind of coming towards the end here, but I mean, but where do you, where do you see this, you know, your particular niche, where do you see things headed as far as beyond seeing beyond the curve because I know one of your strengths is being a visionary but like can you kind of prognosticate where you see things going in the future um I will tell you that uh my perspective on predicting the future the future um you create it and that that's the role that I need to play for my organization and and what do I mean by that right if I'm creating a future, it doesn't mean that the, the picture that I paint is going to be all me or my organization or the, you know, the people around me. There are going to be a lot of other people, organizations, entities with whom I want to collaborate, societies with, that I want to collab with whom I want to collaborate in order to realize that future that I want to create. And, and, and so I've, I've pronounced this uh, to my organization, and this was, this was actually one of the game-changing things, at least for me, 
presenting to my organization my 10-year vision, the vision that I want to realize in, on a, in a rolling 10-year basis is that the world will have access to quality and affordable electroneurodiagnostics, right? And we can paint, right? It's a pencil sketch right now. And I actually said to my organization, hey, here, I, this is me. This is Karthik, the CEO of NeuralERT, who's, who's in the clouds, 60,000 feet above the ground, telling you that we're going to create, we're going to be part of this future that I'm talking about. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to do all of it. We're going to want to find ways to collaborate with other organizations, people that are doing, doing different things. If we, if we understand the role we want to play in building that future, right, let's start collecting like you, right? I mean, what you're doing with this consortium, it's like you're, you're collecting a group of, um, I don't even want to say like-minded people, you're collecting a group of people that have a mindset that is moving forward in such a way that when they, if they work together and when they work together, we're creating something incredible, something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. And, and that, that, that's, that's my vision. I, I, it's, 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 it's that. And um, one thing I want to mention about what it's going to take to get there is that, I don't know if I mentioned to you, uh, Michael, that I wrote an essay. It's my first essay that I published on LinkedIn. And it's called, With 1% More, You Can Change the World. And so it, it references this idea that small incremental changes that we make, right, um, will add up, right? It compounds, to your point, it compounds over the course of a year, over the course of two, three, five, 10 years into something that when you look back, you're like, oh, damn, wow, I can't, I, I can't, even, I can't even imagine that I'd be here uh, today. So, so to answer your question, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to say I'm going to predict the future. I, 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 in fact, I refuse to predict the future. I am. I, I want to. I, I want to be able to work with uh, dear colleagues like you, and uh, you know some of, some of your colleagues that have been on the show, uh, perhaps to define what we want the future to look like. Because that, to me, is that to me is what is is at the center of innovation. That's where you really drive learning. When you say this is what I want it to be, so what do I need to learn? What do I need to do in order to achieve that? What experiments do I need to do? So, awesome. Well, number one, we'll be sure to tag that essay within the description, you know, as this uh, of this of this interview. So, what's the other way that folks can kind of get a hold of you or keep keep tabs on what NeuroAlert is doing? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, I'm I'm not a I'm not a good I'm not a great promoter of 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 myself or my business, but I I would you know I, I welcome these types of conversations. They're they're energy building for me. So thank you, Michael, for this. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a great rest of the day just because I'm like sort of here, you know, in, in this headspace. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm Karthik. Uh, you can go to neuroalert.com, N-E-U-R-O-alert.com. -E um, I have uh, several other organiz organizations under the umbrella, but that's where you can find me. Uh, my email address, K-S-V as in Victor, and then my last name, Sation at neuroalert.com. Um, and otherwise for folks that, uh, that know you would love, love for you to, you know, introduce them to me as they approach you about, about yeah. this content and, and vice versa. Listen, you know, I think this is, um, this is where the, this is where you, you, you create the brain trust, uh, to, to build a future rather than just predict it. Absolutely. Karthik, it's been, it's been amazing to just hear your thinking, I've always appreciated your perspective and just even your passion and clarity of thought and being able to articulate it in a very distinct manner is just, uh, it's always nice to be around you. Similar to you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be buzzing for the remainder of the day. So for those that are in our audience, you know, if you found this content helpful for you, uh, would you mind sharing it on social media? Would you mind commenting, even just uh, liking it? Anything that you can do to promote this is gonna make a world of a difference. At the end of the day, it's about advancing healthcare forward, about providing more access. And we're just extraordinarily grateful to have folks that are listening into this that really deeply care about this topic. This is something that matters a lot to us. And the more innovators that we can bring into our community, the better off we are. So thanks again, Karthik, and I look forward to our next conversation. Appreciate it, Michael. Thanks. It's my pleasure.